I'm just thinking of what's the best thing for the actual scene, what can help it translate better. So I'm not thinking of a cut or I'm not thinking of not cutting, I'm thinking of the scene and how, what's the best way to translate it. I wanted to start by looking at Lover's Rock, specifically the way that, you know, you sort of film time moving through London and through music as well. Music is huge in Blitz and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about how you constructed the scene in which Celeste sings Oh Johnny Oh Johnny Oh in the Café de Paris and it feels like there's, you know, some similar things there. One is live music, there's musicians and one is a record, and there's a DJ. Uh, you know, again, it's and, and it's kind of different kind of gatherings, different kind of social structures. So that dictates how you film something and how you sort of uh, attempt to sort of uh, reveal it. With uh, Blitz, it was a case of the social structure. Beforehand, we, we were in another sort of party that was a, a, a party with, uh, which is mainly sort of uh, immigrant sort of party in London. This is a more hoi polloi, this is more sort of upper middle class white party. And the band, though, is entirely black, which was the case um, with Snake It Johnson, the band leader in uh, Café de Paris. What the Blitz does is basically takes you through a certain kind of situation where we've seen before in the movie people dealing with sort of, um, you, know, you know, rations and dealing with not having much. And we are entering this world where it's lavish. It's an orchestra. It's a twelve more piece band. Uh, with Snake Ip Johnson, this sort of very sort of cavalier sort of band leader, almost like a wizardry ab ab about him, uh, a, a sort of a, you know, Duke Ellington-esque uh, state. So that kind of music is about the live performance and sh the camera is, is, is one continuous shot, so to some extent, uh, there's actually a few cuts in it, what am I saying about? But it does show you what happens in, in the kitchen with, with the food and everything else and coming back on the dance floor. So it just gives you a roundabout idea. With Lover's Rock, it's one room, it's a very small room, it's, it's a very, it's, it's domestic setting. Um, these parties occurred because unfortunately black people were not welcome in, in clubs um, in central London um, and people made their own. So for me there was a sense of communal, the, the, the communalness of it, it was, it was like church. It was like church and what happens with church is that there's a situation um, where things sort of uh, gather, they sort of conjure, they sort of, there's a certain kind of uh, this crescendo and you know in the sense of, of of sort of letting things in as in people say the holy spirit or whatever and that comes out in the music again look most black music is, is based on you know a certain kind of idea of of, of what happened you know you know con contemporary black music american music and, and west indian music slavery had a huge part in how people sort of address music and you know the joy comes from um, mainly religious structures so again it's how you handle handle these things I was wondering if you could talk us through another scene in Blitz in which it's a relatively short scene but when you have George walking through the Empire Arcade and sort mm. of looking at all of the elements in mm. the windows and all of the artifacts mm. um, and it's supremely haunting mm. and you know one thing it brought to mind was one of the scenes in Widows in which you have Colin Farrell's character Jack Mulligan uh, is the tracking shot in the car. The way he's only moving through a couple of blocks but you can see the sort of disparities in the neighbourhoods and you know, the homes and the folks he's leaving in one place and then arriving at in another. I mean, what's interesting with the, with the Jack, Mull Jack Mulligan situation, this is happening in, in, in the periphery as such, because mm. the conversation, you know, you, we're, we're hearing this thing, but again, it's this thing which we're driving past. And he's just done a speech. From there, there's a short drive to his, his, his you know, wonderful house um, in Chicago, which is a short journey. And we're seeing sort of this disparity as, he, as, he, as the car drives along. And we end up in a nanosecond to this amazing part of town. So again, it's, it's the focus of the conversation, but at the same time, I love the idea of focusing on the conversation in the car with, with Colin and his, and his assistant. At the same time, this thing is happening. Is, what, are we, what are they talking about? What, what's that? So there's two things going on at the same time. It's just, it's just much more stimulating, yeah. for, 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 at least for me and for, I, I imagine for hopefully for the audience. Mm. The situation with Empire Arcade, as it was, when George gets in his, his arcade, where we basically were our reflections in shop windows of uh, Empire. I mean, there's a situation where it's very direct um, in a way of, of a shop window. So there's a kind of didactic quality to it, but at the same time, it's interesting because most shop windows are quite sort of didactic and this is this, this is this, this is this, this, very, very straightforward. But it's sort of, it's doing it in a way which is sort of, um, you know, it's products for sale. It's the sort of hoard of the empire. 
and all of a sudden George is put into this as this small black boy. He's seeing how people portray other people. He's seeing what has been has happened. It's a, it's, it's a very I can I say heavy scene because he's put into sort of it's kind of it's like a hall of mirrors. It's like it's a, as I said, yes, it's, a, it's like a hall of mirrors. It's like a sort of haunted house situation where you're seeing the past in the in the present, but presented in a sort of palatable way. It's quite sort of. Uh, horrific for him. Yeah. It feels like when, you know, Benjamin Clementine's character, Ife, arrives at the end of that scene, it's, I mean, I felt a sort of relief in my heart when he arrived. Could you talk a little bit about working with him? Because I think he's just spellbinding on camera. When I was writing the, the piece for uh, a character called Ife, um, he was the person I was having in mind. Um, because there's a certain kind of, um, you know, he's a, he's a gentle man in, in, the, in the real sense of the word. And he, he can translate a certain kind of empathy and a certain kind of decency. And I thought he could, yeah, he was just the perfect person for it. The last time we spoke was about Occupied City, but one shot in Blitz that, um, again, has that sort of same very haunting quality is, is when you sort of have this big pan over the rooftops of London with the smoke billowing mm -hmm. in that way. And it made me think about the approach or the style of Occupied City more broadly, just in the way that um, there's, there's a starkness to it. And, uh, you know, you're sort of forced to just look and one thing that you said to me last year was when talking about the history of occupied city was just that the facts you know speak for themselves and it's up to the audience to take what they'll take from it um i was wondering if any of that was in mind you know when you were filming london in that way you know what it does echo is what's going on now i suppose i'm not so interested in, in you know a certain sense of uh i'm interested in what film can do and how it can actually uh people can react to it or sort of get something from it or sort of how it can sort of provoke. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you see that scene, you're thinking of what's happening right now, uh, you know, elsewhere in the world. I mean, it, there's kind of immediate quality to it. I mean, you know, our film is based in 1940, but you know, we, we could be talking about uh, 2024 for sure. Could you talk a little bit about the, the shot of the flowers in mm -hmm. black and white, which comes back a couple of times and, um, you know, where it's from, what to you it is and what you want folks to see in it? Actually, um, it's from a, a Man Ray movie. I was looking at how people were looking at um, the, the, the first, basically, animators and how they were, and avant garde filmmakers, how they were looking at the, the First World War and what, what experiments were going on then. And I was just looking at these, you know, not to film and whatnot, and I saw the sequence and I thought, this is kind of interesting because what it does, it, it, it is the first section of it, there's an abstract quality to it, it's, it, it actually um, x rays of rock crystals. And um, I was I was sort of putting that together with the sort of um, these bombers coming over the sea and the reflection of the moon, blah blah. But obviously, underneath the sea is, is salt. And it cut to this image of daisies, this sort of daisies. And what it for me was this intent of nostalgia of of what things were, or and could be. And there was hope in those images of the black and white images of daisies. There's a situation of how it was, and how it still it can be. It's not lost. It's not lost, and I, I do believe, obviously, that you know, otherwise I'd be throwing on myself with a bridge already. There is hope, and that is that is that is the sort of that, that's, that's the want. That's, that's 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 the want, and the want could be a dream, want could be a wish, as George uh, pointed out in in the movie. But that 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 that's his wish yeah. to go back to normal, as it were, whatever that is. <laughs>